You know, I started with this with uh, relaxing in paradise. So as I uh, tell the story of um, rebuilding the station and how we got here, just keep this picture in mind. So as I started, um, you know, last year we come to uh, Dayton. We haven't been here for a bunch of years. And, um, you know, see people you haven't seen in a long time. And for people who know me, probably question number one or question number 1A is whatever happened to AP5A. So I'd say on one hand, it was like, well, it's nice to be missed. And I'm under no illusion that the real, the real question was, are we ever going to work AP on the low bands ever again? So a little bit about what happened. So alas, there is no more AP5A. Wow, this is really loud. Not, not that that's a bad thing. But um, so what happened was AP5A was a piece of land that I rented on a part of a very, very, very large plantation. And it was just a small building with some towers around it. And I just paid them you know, a small fee every year to rented the place. So what happened is the family that ran this has been in the business for generations. Most of them have moved on beyond farming. They're lawyers, they're business executives. Some of them live outside the country. And they basically pretty much just rented the land out to be farmed. And they basically let the few buildings that were left there just completely atrophy. They were basically abandoned. They did a minimal amount of lawn mowing. But roofs caved in, walls fell down. Um, and the one building that was habitable for a while was basically overwhelmed with birds and rodents and lizards. It was a really, it was a really depressing place overall. But it was allowed, so it wasn't too bad. So, so for me, there was always this thing hanging over is what's ever going to happen to this place. So they, I, I forced them to maintain the one building I was in while everything else basically just fell apart around me. And then in 2019, I get a message that says, we've sold the place. And basically, what drove it as the value of this property diminished as farming became less and less profitable, if profitable at all, was the legalization of marijuana in Canada. So you had a whole set of Canadian companies that were looking to control their supply. And a number of countries in, in the Caribbean that were actually looking to legalize the cultivation of marijuana, and Barbados was one of them. So this was really their last best chance to really ever sell this property. And it dragged on and on and on, and the new owners had really no interest in talking to me. So I was basically saying, if you're not going to talk to me, I'm not going to take the antennas down to actually close on this thing. So that all went, and then into 2020, finally the deal closed, and it was time to get out. But then COVID hit, and I couldn't go back. So the station had to be taken down by people I knew on the island that had helped me in the past, and they basically scurried around, took everything down. So the question of what happened to AP5A, that happened to AP5A. So basically all the antennas, all the towers, all that stuff was basically jammed in a 40-foot shipping container and taken off site. So, what happened to AP5A? There you have it. But it's been 20 years. And I'd say that by any expectation that I had going in, um, the evolution of that station, the fun I had there, the results I had there, was well in excess of anything that I ever would have expected. So I, yeah, went out with a whimper, not a bang. But nonetheless, at least I have this to show, to me, show for it. So this is my office at home. At, between the ARRL, the CQ WPX, the CQ Worldwide, 36 global wins. Um, 12 second place finishes, that's still a sore point. And, um, you know, and basically um, far more than I ever could imagine. So a pretty good 20 year run. But I missed it. I make no illusion that I missed it. So there's not much I could do about it in 2020. Barbados was closed. Late 2021, it opened again. And I should go there and start looking around. And out of nowhere, of all people, the listing broker on the property of the plantation that was sold actually found a piece of property that she thought that I might be interested in. And so it was not in the place I was expecting to see it, so I actually did some looking online. And um, one thing struck me right away. So this was the old QTH towards Europe. So despite all the, 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 the cues I made from there, it was not a great path to Europe. You know, over, over four miles it had a 500-foot rise, but more importantly, in less than half a mile it had a 250-foot rise. So this is the new location, a little bit better. So it's 1,100 feet. It's got about a 500-foot runway, and then 1,100 feet right down to the ocean. 
So the U.S. path is not nearly as good, but it's still pretty good. It's still 850 feet down, and then it kind of levels off to land. So this is kind of the new place. So one of the questions I got asked uh, and is if I was going to rebuild, and if I was going to rebuild, would I rebuild in Barbados? You know, two-point land, three-point land. You know, I've carped about um, those 12 second-place finishes that would have been first-place finishes. Um, but would I restart someplace else or not? And really, the answer is really in this picture. Two things. Number one is the piece of land. It wasn't like I bought a house. This piece was raw land, no utilities, no buildings, no roads, no nothing. So that's where we were starting from. And the other thing is I had built an infrastructure over time. So these three men, on the left, AP6ET, many of you have worked him as AP1W. In the center is a guy who basically owns a tower company and a rigging company, is fearless, is capable of doing anything. And the guy on the right, we, own, we have an apartment there that we rent year round. He's our landlord, he does property management, knows everybody on the island. You know, I'd be doing this presentation two or three years from now if it wasn't for these three people. So if I was going to start somewhere over without this infrastructure, without this help that I was going to get from these guys, we would have never gotten it done. So when I think about building a new station, it was three and a half acres, it was roughly rectangular. Um, you know, what is really the goal? What are we trying to do? Kind of begin with the end in mind. Um, step number one is I wanted to build the whole station at once. I didn't want to build it one tower at a time. But the key thing is it, it's primarily been a single op all band station, and that was really the primary focus. But I recognize that I'm not going to be able to do that forever. In fact, having not done it for three years, I was wondering if the day I couldn't do it anymore had already passed. And that was a big concern for mine, really serious concern going into this year. So I basically built a station that also could do multi-two and multi-single and actually have three operating positions. You know, at that height, I didn't need a ton of, I, at that low elevation, I didn't need a ton of height, but I wanted to support vertically oriented antennas on low bands. So I needed enough height to basically support high wires in the, in the air. You can see the rest of it, minimum antenna rotation, basically rotators are the number one failure point in these stations. How do you build a station where you don't have to turn the antennas very much? Fault tolerant. I, yeah, I don't want to go there and the antenna's broken, so there's going to be no event or have it fall, fail in the first hour and the contest be over before I even get started. Interstation interference, the bane of existence of S, 2B SIQ is a bane of existence of multi two. How do you build a good, clean station that you can operate on two bands at the same time and not know the other guy is there? Um, I got almost all the way there at the other place and I wanted to basically pick up where I left off there. That is almost never, ever, ever a filting problem. It's almost always a construction problem, a rectification problem, a connector problem of some type. And I really wanted to focus on getting this part of it right. And then I wanted to return it, um, basically be able to operate it remotely. So it all started with a Google map, kind of Google map must have been a cloudy day, so the corner of the property looks all mushy. But it's basically, that's what it really looked like. And I'm drawing tower locations and things like that. So I go from this picture to uh, yada, 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 it's a little bit easier to explain. This is kind of the final product. So basically, there's two towers, two 90-foot towers. So why 90 feet? Is I knew I wanted to stack tri-banders on two on, in two directions, two towards the US, and then from Barbados, Euro the, the Europe is 90 degrees apart. So two aim fixed in the US, two aim fixed at Europe. So I didn't want three guy sets. I wanted two guy sets to make it easier to mount the antennas. And I basically made the towers, the biggest towers I could build safely with two guy sets, and that's why I ended up at 90 feet. So I got two mid tries at the US, two mid tries at Europe, rotatable 40s on the tops of each of those towers, a third tower in the front that actually has a rotatable uh, tri-bander for 10 through 20. So I had a lot of fault tolerance, I had wire antennas between the towers, and I had a fortuitously placed 120 foot palm tree uh, that I got a pulley up near the top. So that's really the station, loop antennas on 80, T antenna on 160, lots of radials, and these towers. And then the shipping containers. So I want to talk about that. In fact, every aspect of this project could have a presentation of itself. And uh, so I want to talk about the shipping containers um, to start. But if you have any questions or want to see more pictures of stuff, I'll be, uh, I'll be around later tonight. So the thing about the land was, I identified the land at the end of 20, 19, 2021, um, we agreed on a price in 2022. We didn't actually close on a contract until the end of April of 2022. So only then can I really start doing things in earnest. But even worse than that, we actually didn't close on the land that actually took possession until the middle of July. So it was actually mid-July before anything can happen. 
So the idea of I can't even start building on the property until I can actually clear the land, which took later another month. The idea of basically using a shipping container, something that looks like this, meant it could be built off-site and it could be built off-site before the property was actually ready to install it. So he was able to get this all done in parallel. The other thing, a shipping container is a temporary structure uh, as opposed to a building, which would require a building permit and everything else that goes with it. So it was a way to grossly accelerate the project, actually no permitting required. So the goal was re to remote it, so I wanted to be really, really careful about um, um, grounding and bonding. I followed N0AX's excellent book as best I could to try and do as many things right as I could. So this is the end of the shipping container with a single point ground on there. So all the coax cables came through the hole in the bottom, they go through the lightning arresters, the single point ground. I've actually got a sub-panel mounted actually on this, so all the power to all the equipment that's actually used at the station actually comes from the sub-panel that's connected to the signal point ground, that's actually connected to the ground rods that are actually right behind, the, um, right behind this wall. So if you go inside, you can actually fit it out a little bit. So the next, this area in the front with the, uh, with the piece of plumbing is, um, that's the operating area. It's 14 and a half feet long by eight feet wide, the, the length of the container. Beyond that is a closet. Beyond that is a bathroom with a toilet and a sink. And two things I did not have at the other location, hot water and a shower. And then beyond that is really a bedroom. So there's a bed, a blow-up bed in there, there's a microwave oven, there's a refrigerator and stuff like that, so a place you can rest. So basically a 40-foot shipping container, really outfitted only for amateur radio. It's not intended to be a lodging. It's basically intended to basically allow me to survive during the duration of a contest. So the other key thing in this is the mentality that I tried to build all along is I wanted to build what I describe as the world's biggest kit. I didn't want to do any fabrication in Barbados. I didn't want to do any engineering in Barbados. I didn't want to do any cable making in Barbados. So I basically did everything I could possibly do at home. All the cables, all the inside cables, all the cables that were going to go on the towers were all built at home. All the switches, all the mounting hardware for the antennas, all that stuff was fabricated at home and carried down in suitcases. Over 2,000 pounds over a number of ships of stuff carried down in suitcases. And the idea is in Barbados, do nothing but assembly. So one of the things we got to assemble is the antennas. So before the property closed, we had the antennas shipped to our apartment, and basically I had antenna parts everywhere. So the apartment's actually pretty bare bones, but basically this is uh, partially assembled booms of four mid-tries in our, in our living room, uh, some partially assembled elements, and then in the kitchen, the, uh, the, the, uh, the clamps to so basically hold it all together. So basically, I was trying to assemble as many things as possible, but I had no place to put them. So I had partially assembled single point grounds, partially assembled antennas, partially assembled mount equipment spread all over the apartment for a couple of months. Eventually, the, um, the shipping container was complete. And one of the things that plagued us month after month after month after month is just, it was a very, very, very rainy year. And in order to bring the cranes in, the shipping container empty weighs 8,000 pounds. So it has to be put in place by a 27 ton crane. And he basically said, if I get stuck in the mud here, there isn't another crane on the island big enough to get me out. So you needed three days of no rain in order to get the equipment in, in order to basically move these things. But we eventually got the shipping container in place, and we started building up the shipping container. So in the room of the single point ground is basically what I call the switching closet, where all the switching is done. Remember, there's a no knobs contest operation. I don't want to have any knobs. I don't have any switches. In fact, I don't even want to see this stuff. So it was all in a room on the end that basically communicates to the main controller PC over Wi-Fi. So on the bottom is all the rotor boxes, it's the power, the remote power control for the remote, it's the watt meters and the Wi-Fi interfaces. At the very top is the ability to take eight potential bands in, basically switch them through a number of switches and then ultimately send three coax cables out to the operating position so it basically enable three positions and basically have three stations that can operate. The next level down is the triplexers that basically take the tribanders and convert them, or the tribanders and basically convert them into basically single band antennas, 10, 15, and 20. And then between the triplexers is basically a stack match. So I could basically take the Europe feed, the Europe feed, the rotatable feed, and the US feed and basically take each of those antennas individually or basically combine them and beam in multiple directions at once. And then I had the filtering ultimately to complete the triplexer and allow the triplexers to work. So with the switching closet done, it was actually time 
Remember that big empty room with a piece of plumbing on the floor? This is actually the operating system, the operating position that ultimately got built. So that's some very, 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 very basic, um, well, basic looking uh, tables built. There's actually some cleverness to it. I could show you that uh, offline if you're interested. But basically three operating positions. Um, and the goal of the operating is basically focus on the computer, occasionally touch the radio, seldom touch the mouse, and don't touch anything else. And that's basically the model of how to operate the station. So eventually the entire station was built, the switching, all that stuff, but no towers. So it's basically a shipping container with a state-of-the-art station and nobody to work. Eventually they got the towers in. It took them four aborted trips where they went up there and it was too muddy to work. And they finally went up there our last time and it started pouring and they basically said, we got all the equipment here, we're gonna get this project done. And they basically did it in the fog to the point where you couldn't see the tops of the towers, but they eventually got them in. So one of the things I wanted was I wanted elevated gui uh, um, guy posts for a variety of reasons. It's a lot easier to inspect the ground connection in terms of for corrosion. It also lifts it up off the ground, less likely to hit your head. Um, there's cows behind me in the field that sometimes, sometimes take a little traipse across the property. You know, I don't want them hanging up and getting stuck and hung up in, um, in um, ground rods and um, uh, guy anchors. So these were actually fabricated down there by my tower guy. He did a phenomenal job, really, really clean. And um, so I basically have elevated guy anchors and the two guy points. 